in the name of Jesus drought in your life that even when it is physical rainy season it is still dry season spiritually financially and otherwise I decree and declare let the rain begin to fall let the rain begin to fall let the rain begin to fall you welcome to another spirit filled message on christocentric message if you're new to this channel i would entreat you to hit on that subscribe button and then to like this video as well i would want you to share this message across because we believe that as this message is coming forth it's going to bless you your graces are going to be imparted onto you and then god is going to visit your home thank you for watching stay blessed the word doctrine comes from the Latin word doctrina. It means a set of beliefs that transit a student to reflect the knowledge of the master. So the end point of doctrine is that the student becomes like the master. Are we together now? There is the third layer to scripture is called the prophetic layer. Now the prophetic layer is with respect to the unique revelation the Holy Spirit gives you from that scripture that may be applicable to you alone and to your spiritual work. It becomes an error when you convert a prophetic speaking to become a doctrine. You see, so under the influence of the prophetic, any scripture can mean anything with respect to what God is doing in your life. You see that now yeah the statement come from any part of scripture can be for you the revelation that brings you into a new season but it is unique to your dealing with God and he will culture your mind to understand what he intended for you to understand from that statement it is for your benefit I'll give you an instance I would always like to give this reference Galatians chapter 2 and verse 2 um, Paul made a profound statement there and he said, I went up by revelation. Now from a contextual standpoint, he just meant I moved to another region. There's no, I mean, he was just, it was just a continuation of his story. And he said, I got to another place. It's like saying I moved from London to Leicester. And so he says, I went up by revelation. But spirit of God can carve out a prophetic meaning out of that that we ascend in the spirit and in life on account of the revelation that we have you never go down when you have revelation you go up by revelation now you cannot make a doctrine out of this but from a prophetic standpoint it has become profiting to you so it will sponsor a passion for revelation and when someone asks you, why are you serious with the word like this? You will tell them that the Spirit of God taught you that the way we go up is by revelation. Are we learning now? Yeah, so I want to look at um, the subject of the harvest first from a doctrinal standpoint. And then hopefully by the evening session would we'll now bring other expressions to it as it relates to our lives are we ready amen let me start um, by saying a word or two about God's end time program um, and, and this is a burden in my heart pastor it's, it's something that I think that most believers are at a loss as to God's program God's burden God's expectation the believers work and even ministry should be derived from this understanding what God intends to be done what God is doing now hallelujah are we learning now and so um, I have generally taught that the program of God is threefold number one there is what he is doing as far as the world of unbelievers is concerned God has a unique program for the unsaved. God has a unique program for the church. And God has a unique program for the nations. This threefold dimension must be understood if you want to do business with God. So there is a dimension of God's program that is uniquely carved out 
for the, the unbelieving world, the world of sinners as we call it. But there is a dimension of his program that you cannot understand until you are saved. If you are outside of the fold, you will be at a loss as to what he is doing. It is uniquely carved out to his body, the church. Then there is a dimension of God's program that is to society and territory. I just needed to say this because it forms a good foundation for us to know. And of these three programs, the most important in order of spiritual priority is God's program to the lost. In as much as these programs are threefold, they do not carry the same value or the same emphasis per time, per season, and per dispensation. Are we learning already? I'm just putting a foundation for us to understand. So for instance, as a preacher and as a ministry, now you understand that in doing ministry, I have a threefold responsibility that has been derived from God's desire. There has to be a program to the unreached, the program to the church, the body, and then a program that affects society. And this threefold program is really where the great commission what we call the mandate what drives the believer any effective believer must be driven by this threefold mandate until now i think that there has been a um i would consider it quite a mistake in our understanding of what we know to be the great commission because for the average believer our idea of the Great Commission is just the evangelistic dimension of the Great Commission. So when we say the Great Commission, we think saving or winning the lost. And that is wonderful. But that is only one aspect of the Great Commission. If you really want to understand the Great Commission as Jesus intended, you have to explore Mark 16, Matthew 28, and Acts chapter 1. These scriptures together bring a holistic picture of the Great Commission. So Mark chapter 16 from verse 15, Jesus was speaking and he said, um, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Right? Verse 16 says, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. So he says to preach. The word preach means to declare, to announce. It's a message that is already given. To declare it and to announce it to every creature. Now when you go to Matthew chapter 28, Jesus, same Jesus is speaking. And he says to go into all the world. And this time around, he does not say preach. He says to disciple nations teaching them to observe it was part of his mandate too to observe everything that i have taught you and that whilst you are doing that be sure that i'm going with you so this is another dimension he now says preach the gospel to every creature but here he now says in matthew chapter 28 to disciple nations when we get to acts chapter 1 from verse 8 it says ye shall receive power after that the holy ghost is come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me now he begins to mention jurisdictions jerusalem judea samaria and the end the uttermost part of the earth you will be witnesses unto me you see that now that means that if you are to understand the great commission in the great commission is preaching in the great commission is teaching and in the great commission is witnessing three of them are not the same you see a witness does not use words alone the assignment of a witness is to convince you to validate the reality of a person or the truthfulness of a statement so what you do as a witness is very different from what you do as a teacher is very different from what you do as a preacher and these three are we understanding so far yeah 
if you do not understand this your christian experience will be very ineffective very ineffective hallelujah so i needed to put that background so that we understand that god's program affects the world of sinners or unbelievers let me remind you one last time god's program affects the world of believers even though already saved because you see as you will be learning if the only experience you have is salvation that is wonderful but you will not be a great tool in the hands of god because um salvation affects your spirit man but the journey to transformation is what affects your mind turning you to a believer but even at that you are still not effective because you cannot perform the mandate of the kingdom as a believer you will have to transit to become a witness you don't need empowerment as a believer you need enlightenment and transformation empowerment happens when you are a witness so whilst they were under the tutelage of Jesus. He didn't talk about empowerment at all. Lecture after lecture, helping them to understand the kingdom. Now, when they had the information, he said, Tari, you have the word, but don't go yet until you be endued with power. The value of the empowerment is that it came upon minds that were transformed. Now, we have corrupted this formula. This is the reason why our witness is poor. So there are people who get saved and all they want immediately is empowerment. It doesn't happen that way. So they keep crying for the anointing and the Holy Spirit says it's a corruption of the protocol. When you are saved, the next port of call is the journey of transformation. And the journey of transformation happens when three forces are made available in your life. Number one, the force of the word. Number two, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Number three, the ministry of the teaching priests. If these three dimensions are not captured in your life, you will not grow. The Utopian Enoch said, how can I understand except some man explain it unto me? He was reading. So he had access to at least the writings. But he said, some man will need to explain to me. When God wants to help a believer, he grants you an opportunity to be saved and then to be planted under the ministry of a teaching priest. That way your growth becomes methodical, line upon line, precept upon precept. It enhances your process of transformation. Are we together? And then when you are transformed, you get to a level where a conversion begins to happen from a believer to a witness it is at the point of being a witness you can now be sent to the nations so when god calls you he does not call you into an assignment no he calls you to himself then he sends you to the nations are we learning now okay so let me get to my subject now amen First Timothy chapter 2, 1 to 4. Blessed be the name of the Lord. First Timothy chapter 2, 1 to 4. The Bible says, Therefore, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Verse 2. For kings and for all who are in authority that we may lead a quiet and a peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Verse 3, it says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. Then it gives you a very profound information that that Savior has a desire. He was speaking about praying for those in authority, but now he talks about the Savior and he uses that opportunity to say something very profound that that savior has a desire and the desire is twofold number one that all men be saved is that in your bible that all men be saved and then number two 
that those who are now saved should come unto the knowledge of the truth please do not forget this so god our savior has a desire his desire in order of spiritual priority is that number one all men all people groups all nations be saved and then that when they are saved that they come unto the knowledge of the truth hallelujah are we learning nicodemus came to jesus by night in john chapter 1 from verse 1 and he said rabbi we know that thou art a teacher come from god john chapter 3 and he said for no man can do these miracles which thou doest except god be with him and they began a discussion by the time we get to verse 15 jesus was now speaking to nicodemus and he said that he did not come to condemn the world john chapter 3 and verse 15 and that anyone whosoever would believe in him would not perish then we get to verse 16 a popular scripture we all know here's what it says for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son right then he makes a very profound statement that whosoever whosoever there are certain realities in the bible where the bible will say he gave on to some like the ministerial gifts but in administering or communicating his desire to see all men saved he said whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life verse 17 says for god did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved do you believe this this is very important now let's go to matthew chapter 9 all that i've said will make sense now pastor daily already read it but let's go back and visit it again verse 36 matthew chapter 9 and verse 36 blessed be the name of the lord but when he saw the multitudes please say the multitudes so the statement that you are about to read was motivated by something he saw it's important to take note of that he saw the multitudes he did not see things he saw men so every other thing he's about to say is connected to men are we together now the bible says when he saw the multitudes he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd then he makes a profound statement verse 37 he said to his disciples so his disciples were not part of the men he saw there were two groups there one they were the men he called multitudes and two there was a group he was speaking to called disciples are we together he spoke to his disciples and said the harvest hmm, the harvest is truly plentiful but the laborers are few the instruction next verse pray ye pray ye that is your response to that situation pray ye the lord of the harvest to send laborers into his harvest please let's go to the verse 37 now so he says the harvest watch this now jesus looks at the multitudes and then he says the harvest so in god's mind his first definition of the harvest is not agriculture his first definition of the harvest is anyone who is not saved in the mind of god everyone who has not come into the knowledge of god anyone who has not accepted the lordship of christ is called the harvest not a sinner the harvest this is a name he gives them the harvest meaning that at any given point they are ripe listen carefully so in the mind of god 
he sees a child who is a drunkard a lady who is a prostitute somebody and he says there is no time that is ever late when the harvest not a crop that is growing a harvest <laughs> the harvest is plentiful he says the problem is not the harvest the problem is the quality of the laborers so that you are not able to bring a harvest it's not because the harvest is unwilling to be harvested if i will use that expression that something about the inefficiency of the laborers is what is wasting the harvest are we learning now so jesus looks at men and says the harvest you would think he's talking about crops you would think he's talking about we're coming to other dimensions there don't miss the evening because in the evening i'll be teaching you that everybody is a farmer hmm. everybody is a farmer and i will show you two kinds of soils do i give you a teaser The Bible says, he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap. So the flesh is also a soil and it produces a certain kind of harvest. Then it says, he that sows to the spirit, another kind of soil shall of the spirit reap. So we will consider the kinds of harvest that come from these soils. Leave that for the evening. But now we're discussing doctrine. <laughs> Are we learning now? blessed be the name of the Lord so Jesus is speaking here he says the harvest is truly plentiful but the laborers are few the laborers are few in God's mind the problem is not the difficulty of the harvest the laborers are few every unsaved person I wrote here every person who is yet to acknowledge the lordship of jesus over their lives in the mind of god is called the harvest this is a profound revelation the mandate of world evangelization the mandate of reaching the lost is god's is is god's um, is the most important priority right now in the heart of god and should be the most important priority and pursuit for every believer are we together now in order of priority that anyone who truly loves jesus anyone who truly desires to be part of god's end time program must understand not just his burden his desires but also understand the order of priority that world evangelization the bible says this is very profound jesus looked at them and he said the harvest is plentiful but the laborers are few he says pray ye the lord of the harvest it was a prayer request Jesus was giving them a prayer request. Pray ye the Lord of the harvest that he may send out laborers. He never said that he may find laborers. Because the word send is a very important word. It's a very complicated word. It, does just not, it, it doesn't just mean to call and commission. It is the entire capture of the process from finding, training, building, accrediting and then sending when he says send the laborers he's not just saying cherry pick people and say go to no 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 part of what makes you the laborer is mastery on how to use the sickle every laborer who goes to the harvest must know how to use the sickle are we together because that is the instrument of harvest let's talk a bit about the mandate of world evangelization i thought to really drum this to our hearts this morning second peter chapter 3 and verse 9 is god speaking to someone already 
second peter chapter 3 and verse 9 the lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness but is long suffering towards us and not willing believers hear me not willing that any should perish that includes your unsaved loved ones are we together that includes somebody somewhere in Leicester, someone across UK. He is not willing. That means for anyone who perishes, it is outside of God's will. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Does that look like the first message, the first evangelical message? recorded from the lips of the apostles the bible says on the day of pentecost peter began to teach and said this is that from joel to david and finally he said O israel let it be known to you that this same jesus whom you have crucified has today been exalted as lord and christ the bible says when they heard the message they were caught to the heart and they said men and brethren what should we do and he said repent for the remission of your sin and you shall receive this promise then he says for the promise is unto you to your children your children's children as many as are afar off even as many as the lord he will call so when it has to do with world evangelization the mission to the lost the mission to the unsaved it is every man's business it is not the business of the evangelist it is not the business of the pastor it is not the business of church goers it is everybody's business this is the greatest burden in the heart of god that all men be saved and that none should be lost are we together now you cannot say you love God and not be interested in that which satisfies his desires. So you see, there are many people who sing about loving God. There are many people who write books about loving God. There are many people who propose that they love God. But there's no evidence. Simon Bajona, lovest thou me more than this? He says, yea, Lord. He said feed my sheep he said feed my lamb something you do to my sheep and my lamb is proof that you love me something you do about those who are lost is proof that you love me you can cry that you love God you can sing that you love God you can kneel while crying and that may be sincere but in the mind of God those who love him are those who pay attention to what gives him joy did you get that those who truly love God they are not just those who write songs about love they are not just who do Christian things as wonderful as it is in God's mind the ultimate proof of love for him is to become an active participant in bringing to fulfillment this desire that all should be saved and none should be lost hmm. now without any sense of sarcasm do you know how many of us preachers are about ministry for years and decades and the salvation of the lost is never captured in our lives our desires nor our programs isn't that incredible and many this this is not just something we have left the business of soul winning to evangelists and crusades and evangelical conferences it was never supposed to be so if one man has to set up a stadium full of people and everybody's at the mercy of that one man salmon it is too small the laborers are few the laborers are few because many who are laborers do not know they are laborers say they look up to the few and call them laborers and they do not know that being a laborer is the mandate god gave everybody are we together now imagine if the world has only two or three billy grahams reinhard bonkers you would think the world will be saved the world will not be saved 
because they are men they are limited they are not omnipresent they are not omnipotent they are not omniscient they can be tired they can feel fatigued it is the reason why you see preachers today get tired weak and some even die doing ministry because the laborers a few and the orientation is that there are a few people freelancing their christian experience then a handful of others called ministers who have the mandate to save the loss while the remaining stand as cheerleaders it is a very dangerous orientation so it puts the burden on a few people you have to be everywhere at every program going from pillar to post you do that for 10 years you cut short your life by yourself it was not supposed to be so god's desire is that across every region there be enough laborers trained mentored built empowered by the spirit to bring a great harvest there are laborers in leicester who do not know they are laborers they keep searching around for laborers and say wow that's an anointed man of god meaning that is a laborer and they even pray for that man may he win souls well and they do not take that responsibility the average church goer is not apostolic in their understanding it's not apostolic in their training it's rather needy so the entire scope of the believer's experience is to come and receive things that can help them make ends meet and there is nothing kingdom come in their pursuit you invited me here <laughs> pastor daily are we together isn't it amazing that the orientation of the average believer and now when i speak like this i speak from a standpoint of love the average believer has no business about god's program his orientation is that god owes him to make his life better to make him maybe wealthier happier solve his problems and if god doesn't get to do that the preacher who now says he's the representative of god will have to pay the price so preachers are under pressure you see that and with all due respect even for denominations that say they are evangelicals it's rather a name than a practice it's, it has become a denomination that maybe have rejected any other practice and just we are this but there is no practice there there is nothing that attests to the fact that they are passionate about soul winning listen i want you to pay attention to what i'm saying because your relevance in this end time will depend on how much you are part of god's program the bible says i shall not die most times we quote it there it didn't stop there but leave and declare the basis for my being alive is that i am an active participant in god's program my immunity my what do you call it in uk what's the insurance policy for long life for <laughs> life assurance life insurance does it work i'm joking there are many believers who hate untimely death but they have not justified their need for longevity because the basis for living long is not the fear of death the basis for living long is that you need this body to serve the purposes of the kingdom he says i shall not die but live and declare so if you are not declaring look at me many of you here own companies after covid when you wanted to downsize some of your staff what was the basis efficiency efficiency so if you're reducing your staff structure from 30 to 15 the basis would be those who are not bringing value listen the bible says he suffered no man to do them wrong he's not speaking about everyone 
there are some them who have plunged into God's program that he can reprove kings for you see that so when you say no weapon fashion against me it is not just because um, what makes you special is number one what Jesus has done and then number two the degree to which you have become a pillar in his program this is where the immunity of a believer lies there are many believers who are not serving the purposes of the kingdom not in any way and in any sense you make yourself a prey when i sent you lackest thou anything there are people who want to deal with lack and they think it's just a financial problem no provision was supposed to honor your passion for that service why should god give you 10 million dollars 100 million dollars what percentage of it supports kingdom come when i sent you when you agreed to be a laborer did you lack i hope you are learning i'm planting a burden in your heart i'm showing you from the lens of scripture that many of us do not truly love jesus you want to love him or you think you love him This is not about being a preacher, no. This is not about church, no. How many unsaved people live among us, walk with us, and there has never been any, the problem is not the inability to teach. I'm going to be showing you the problem with the laborers shortly. <laughs> But the real problem is that there is something wrong with our orientation. We do not think we should be part of God's soul winning project. So a few times we'd have some missionary somewhere or some pastor somewhere just drum it and say, look, you need to go to the mission field. Um, it's beyond going to the mission field. It starts with an orientation. Do I love Jesus enough? To drink of his body that anybody I see look at Paul Paul was in prison and he was not thinking about his deliverance get me a paper and a note I hear that the church something is wrong with a particular church I need to address some things and you tell them there when I come out of the prison I'm coming there to come and straighten some things this is a man who is in the prison he's not even he's not concerned about his being in prison Can you imagine that I, I i read the book of acts and sometimes i'm amazed at what drove these people if i come out of a prison somewhere i will get out of that city but these guys will come out of the prison knowing that they would search for them and look what happened if you read acts chapter 16 paul and silas remember the jailer wanted to kill himself and said no oh, that's a waste you are a harvest your family is a harvest. We are not in a hurry to run. Let's go to your house. This was someone who was jailed, about to be killed. After such a spectacular miracle, what you want to do is to write a book about that event and hopefully make a name from it, not the apostles. Jailer, don't kill yourself. It is God's will that you live and not die. He does not want any man to perish. He said, can we go to your house? Paul is in prison and he's thinking how many more people need to be saved to the point of death these guys were only concerned about salvation this is the reason why their Christian experience was authentic and it carried the kind of power we are still looking for praying for fasting for but never comes because the drive that necessitates that power is not our drive Today we pray wanting signs and wonders. We want to do all kinds of supernatural things. The purpose largely is for self. 
and that is too small a reason to receive of these precious things most of the people who carried the anointings and the graces we admire did not pray for them they only prayed for a heart Billy Graham did not pray for global influence. He only prayed for a heart and an opportunity to reach the unreached. And he got to a point where he was an advisor to kings. It was said when Queen Elizabeth went to a, a challenge season right here in UK, he was part of the people who sent one thing, someone from her cabinet had to reach Billy Graham. She called and needed counsel and comfort. And he wrote a letter comforting her and they responded how she was touched and challenged by the things that he wrote. One of the few preachers that had access to preach in North Korea. Why did God elevate the man so much? Do you know many of the things we pray for today were supposed to follow our passion for God's program? Believe me, yeah. we isolate ourselves from God's program and begin to make demands. Demands that should only come when it finds us in active duty as laborers. Are we together now? Do you not, did you read in your Bible that a laborer or a worker is deserving, worthy? It's not something to beg about. There is a portion, not just for believers for laborers the reason why your portion has not come is because it came and did not find a laborer it came and found someone trying to coerce god bring me the money bring me the fame bring me the healing anointing for what i just need people to know that i'm a great man of god i'm tired of feeling like i'm powerless and that drives us to go and fast that drives us to go and pray nothing is wrong with the experience but the motivation behind it is what is corrupt I show you why we have not seen the power of God the way we desire because we do not understand his drive the drive is usually to use it to build empires to build a name Apostle Joshua Selman great man of God no. are we learning so every unbeliever is called the harvest even if that is your husband every unbeliever is called the harvest even if that is your spouse your son your daughter your driver a worker somewhere the harvest the harvest if you change from calling people sinners you don't want to go near a sinner there is a psychology to that name because you want to move away from what can corrupt you. So laborers run away from their harvest because of the names that they call it. Jesus called them the harvest. Hmm. That changes as simple as this sounds. It will change your orientation. So if you see that woman as a prostitute, John chapter 4 will never happen. But when you see her as a harvest, when you see the madman in Gadara as a madman whose madness can corrupt you, you will run away from him. But when you see him as the harvest, the reason why we are not able to reach even to the uttermost is the names we have given people. When you see them as the harvest, even when they do not deserve to be loved, you can reach them. Because in the mind of God, everyone the bible talks about the look at look at jesus's you see the, the scripture is a capture of the mind of god that a man has hundred sheep is that in your bible do you believe the bible and then because one sheep pastor got missing let me tell you what i would do if i were that man i would protect the 99 and just cry over the one sheep for two days and say well sorry you gave yourself to lions i would not i would rather focus on the 99 but not jesus not jesus ah not jesus not jesus he would leave the 99 
and go around looking for the one what manner of love is this he can leave everyone in Leicester and look for you and look for you with such passion and vulnerability it will flatter you what is in man that you are so mindful of can't you do without me that is the reason why for some of you in spite of the fact that you ran away from him in spite of the fact that there are many people telling him i love you he's still he wanting to hear your own i love you and he will pursue you he will ah. that's the character of love when a man loves a woman just for this example there are all kinds of skills that are invented in honor to that love. He wants to reach her. If it means if phones don't work, network is not working, he can collaborate, he can partner, he can network, he can whatever it is. She says, wait outside, and he waits for one hour. Sorry for keeping him. Say, me? Sorry for what? <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm, I'm very fine. I mean, you, you, you can't imagine how motivated I am standing here. That's what love can do. Hmm. Are we together? Don't tell me you love God. Show me the passion. Let the passion do the speaking. Beyond your songs. Jesus for you. He lives 99. Or should I sing it? Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, he chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I don't earn it and I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending Yes, sir. That's how far he can come for you. If there was only one sinner on earth, he would still die. He didn't die just because of numbers. He died because of love. Every one person was worth that sacrifice now today we claim to be witnesses and yet the passion is not there the harvest he saw the multitudes and the next thing that followed was compassion compassion he saw them as sheep without a shepherd and he looked to the disciples you know what he was telling them very soon I'll be on my way. You'll be the ones here. This is the template I'm giving you. That every time you see the multitude, don't see a reason to complain. Don't see a reason to condemn. Call them the harvest. Call your unsaved husband the harvest rather than a troublemaker. The moment you call him the harvest, you become a laborer in partnership with God for his salvation. Is God speaking to us this morning? No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up. Coming after me, no wall you won't kick down. No shadow you will light up. Mountain you will climb up. Coming after me, no wall you won't kick down. Please be seated. I've said a few things in the course of this conference and I want you to remain connected to my thoughts. Number one, I started by telling you that God's end time program is threefold. 
that there is a program for the world of sinners, unbelievers, the unsaved. Remember that there is a program for the church, the believing world. Number three, there is a program for territories and society. Are we together? And that in order of priority, the most important, God would rather the rest fail. The most important is his program for the unsaved world. That should be reflected in our priorities. You don't have to be an evangelical if for, for want of word. That means that ratio that emphasis the ratio of soul winning to teaching must be captured even in our lives it cannot be 10 teaching then one salvation we are flipping it over are we together now yes so that when it has to do with soul winning you do not call sinners sinners it will affect your passion you, call, you cannot have love towards someone when you call them a sinner. There is a name that makes you a laborer. The name is the harvest. Listen, this changed my life. Every time I see an unsaved person, sincerely, in my mind, I'm thinking the harvest. The harvest, it tells you two things. One, that person is ripe. You don't have to wait. At every given point and with every opportunity you have, they are called the harvest. You don't go to a tree or a crop that is still growing and is not yet ripe and then try to pluck it up. But once you call it the harvest, it means in the mind of God, that person is ready. In the bus, ready. In the plane, ready. Through the internet, ready. They are called the harvest. I cultivated by this revelation a supernatural compassion for people. When I look at people, I look at them not from the lens of being judgmental or condemning. I call them the harvest. The harvest. Are we learning? There are three things that every laborer, three, there are three things every laborer must have with respect to the harvest. Three. Number one, every laborer must know where the harvest is. You must know where the field is. You cannot be a laborer and not know where you are going to harvest. You must know where the field is. Number two, you must understand the system or the art of harvesting itself. The ability to use your sickle for that harvest. Are we together? I understand that you do a lot of farming in UK too, am I right on that? Yeah. And no matter how mechanized it is, whether it's by the use of machines, you will still have to learn how to harvest, how to use the machine. You need to go to the right location. And Jesus gave us the location already. You know where the location is? Everywhere. The entire earth is the field. Samaria. If you are in Samaria, you are in the right place. If you are in Judea, you are in the right place. If you are in Jerusalem, you are in the right place. <laughs> if you are the uttermost part of the earth, you are in the right place. In a bank, the right place. The market, the right place. In fact, if you are in the internet, in the right place. Amazing. With clarity and precision, he gave us the location everywhere. Everywhere you find men is the field. Everywhere. Provided you can find a man there, 
if there are men in Leicester then this is the field if there are men somewhere in London this is the field if there are men in Congo DRC South Africa wherever there anywhere there are men so the believers orientation is that everywhere you see men that becomes your harvest field and the men become your harvest but the next thing is you must know how and in this kingdom harvest is done please listen carefully with respect to soul winning the way you harvest is to understand the message and to know how to communicate it you cannot be a laborer if you do not know the message that saves tl osborne of blessed memory wrote a very powerful book is god helping us this morning He's, he wrote a book called The Message That Saves. Please look at me. It is not every information about Jesus that saves. There is an exact body of revelation about Jesus that translates to salvation. If you believe Jesus was a prophet, you are right, but you will not be saved by that revelation. That is not the revelation of him allocated for salvation. If you believe Jesus was a good man, you are right. A philanthropist, you are right. Huh? If you believe Jesus was an intelligent man, you are right. A kind man, you are right. If you believe Jesus was a teacher, you are right. But none of this is connected to salvation. So don't just say you believe Jesus. What about Jesus do you believe? Because demons too believe Jesus many believers say they believe in jesus many preachers preach jesus there is an exact content about jesus that translates to salvation are there kingdom laborers in this place you cannot go to the farm now you know that all men unsaved are the harvest you know that everywhere is the field but my question is have you gained mastery on how to use your sickle Remember, in the mind of God, every harvest is malleable enough depending on the efficiency of the laborer. When the harvest looks tough, it is not tough. It is because the laborer was not trained. Please look at me. You do mechanized agriculture in the UK. And how many of you know that you can calculate with precision how many hectares and acres can be harvested pending on the capacity of the machine there is science to it you can know that i can harvest these tons of this and you get up you have people have formulated businesses around it if agriculture can give you that level of precision it means when you become an effective laborer you should be able to know that i can take lester in this amount of time i'll be rounding up this teaching hopefully in our final session by showing you you are not only a laborer you are a co-laborer this is where your confidence comes from because you are working in partnership with one called the lord of the harvest i hope we'll have time and i will take you to the book of ruth and show you what boaz was doing in the field together with his people while they were harvesting the Lord of the harvest his presence has an effect on your efficiency the Lord of the harvest is not the father the Lord of the harvest is not Jesus the Lord of the harvest is the Holy Spirit he is the supervisor of this project this is why we do not fail Are we learning? Back to my teaching. I have to find somewhere. I hope. Yeah. Let's pray in tongues for one minute. Yeah. Pray in the spirit for one minute. My beloved is the most beautiful among thousands just pray in the spirit for one minute my beloved is 
the most beautiful among thousands and thousands Yeshua ah, 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 Jesus name please be seated please be seated hallelujah are we still together I want you to pay attention now pastor Jesus is with his disciples and he asked them a question he said who do men say that I the son of man am and they started noising all kinds of things some say you are Elijah some say you are one of the prophets they were confused themselves then he said you have walked with me leave the strangers who do you say what is your verdict you ate with me we went for crusades together and he was shocked that none of them proximity and yet they did not know who he was then Peter speaking by the Spirit said I know the knowledge of God is very personal I know he never said we know <clears throat> I know who thou art thou art Christ the son of the living God and Jesus said flesh and blood hath not revealed this to you but my father in heaven and then he says verse 18 I say also to you you are Peter and upon this understanding upon this revelation upon this strategy i will build my church <coughs> excuse me what strategy that you are christ the son of the living god there is a threefold revelation about jesus christ that everyone must know to be saved number one you must know him as savior number two you must know him as Lord. Three, you must know him as Christ. Savior, Lord, and Christ. Let it be known to you, O Israel, that this same Jesus whom you have crucified has today been exalted as Lord and Christ. Can we examine that for a few minutes as we wrap up this morning session? What does it mean for Jesus to be Savior? What does it mean to call him Lord? Because the Bible says the moment you call him Lord, there must be an effect in heaven, in the earth, and under the earth. Am I right on that? That every knee will bow and every tongue will confess when you invoke his lordship that means the revelation of dominion is connected to his lordship if you do not know him as lord you can be saved but you will never manifest kingdom authority the earth is the lord's when it has to do with ownership and dominion the office responsible is that of the lord the lord said to my lord is that in your Bible? Sit down at my right hand until I make your enemies. So let's look at this for the next five minutes or so. Blessed be the name of the Lord. There is a threefold revelation of Jesus that brings salvation and helps every believer to be an effective laborer as far as the harvest is concerned number one jesus as savior luke 19 10. jesus as savior please read with me if you can see it or at least i'll read it from here for the son of man has not come or has come to seek and to save that which was lost is that in your bible 
he came to seek and to save seek and to save he didn't just come to save he came to seek there is a strategy there to seek and to save the first thing you do with what is lost is to find it then you save it he came to seek that which was lost and to save that which was lost in Titus chapter 2 and verse 13 please write if you're writing Titus chapter 2 and verse 13 help us media here's what the Bible says looking for the glorious the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ so Jesus came as Savior Jesus came as Savior this is very powerful there is a revelation connected to his being a savior is the revelation of love and forgiveness when you know him as savior you understand his love and his power to forgive the bible says while we were yet sinners christ loved us christ forgave us are we together the gospel of salvation as we know is a revelation of the father's love please listen a revelation of the father's love captured in and through the substitutionary sacrifice of jesus are we together man and creation being the object of that sacrifice this is the gospel of salvation it matters what you tell the people there is a narrative about jesus you sell to the nations they will not be saved they will reject you they will hate you they will fight you and we're selling a narrative there is a kind of jesus we are presenting to the nations that is misrepresenting him when it has to do with the harvest the name of the sickle is love hmm. when it has to do with the harvest the name of the sickle is love did you get that if what you preach is not the love of jesus sinners will not be saved it doesn't matter how intelligent what you say is you don't have to mention the word l-o-v-e the idea of love must be communicated you must let them know that he came to die not just for himself otherwise you will sell a selfish jesus who came to redeem a property just for himself for his namesake no why did he come why did he have to die are we together now the bible says the soul that sinned it shall die based on god's justice system everybody should die for their sins if god were to be just you cannot punish another man for another man's sin no everyone should die for his sin and so jesus came and by covenant he put the whole world in himself and died the death of every man so that he can impart his righteousness on that every man he died for when you explain the love of Jesus, listen, explaining the love of Jesus is not pampering people and leaving them in their condition. No, no. You let them know that he loved them enough that he did not have to wait for them to pray and desire his redemption. He went ahead. Hallelujah. When we get to heaven, one of the ways you will know Jesus is not through his crown. Many people have crowns. The elders have crowns. There is a crown for Matthias. But everyone who will lift his hands, you will see only one with a scar. It's a scar that it is a testament of his love. It has branded his love through all eternity. There are Matthias that have scars all around their bodies but not from the nails not by the cross that is how far he loved you that is how far he loved me listen to me 
Jesus Christ, knowing God's claim of justice, that 33-year-old man was beaten and he bled. And as a human, because he was in, in human form, he thought of giving up. But when he remembered you, you were worth that pain. You were worth that tears. You were worth that passion. I hope you know that Jesus hung naked. When you watch him in movies, it's just because for social reasons. But he was hung naked. And while he was there, watching the people he fed, as they said, crucify him. Watching the people he healed. My question is, where was the woman with the issue of blood when Jesus was crying on the cross? Where was blind Bartimeo? Where was Lazarus, who he raised from the dead? They all ran away, but it was not enough for him to abort that project. He hung upon that cross and made a profound statement. It is finished. And you would think that was the end of it. When Jesus gave up the ghost, sin one was over. Sin two was not known by anyone until it was revealed to Paul. Paul gave us the continuation of that discussion because when sinners die, they don't go where God is. When he died as sin, Jesus did not die as a sinner. He died as sin. And the Bible lets us know that he went to Hades and when he got there Satan did not know that the death of Jesus was part of the wisdom of God that he hid that if the princes had known they would not free Barabbas if they knew that was a strategy for my redemption and your redemption you see that the wife of Herod came and warned him and said I perceive this man is innocent he said no I have to honor the people it was part of the love and the wisdom of God playing out. Is someone learning now? And the Bible tells us that the cohort of hell, they were all on him, forcing him to bow to the lordship of Satan. But when the legal claims of justice were satisfied, my goodness, my God, he made a public show of them. It's in your Bible. Triumphing over them in it. And then he went to Satan and said, give me the keys. The keys Adam gave you, give it to me. Revelation chapter 1, I am he that was dead and now is alive. I died but I am not dead. And when he collected that key, the Bible says he led captivity captive. Is that in your Bible? And then Peter tells us that he went to the prison and preach the gospel to the departed saints who had believed in hope and they believed him and he opened the prison gate and he marched no longer as God's only begotten son but now the first begotten when Jesus resurrected graves were opened this is in your Bible and people came out of that grave and they walked through the streets of Jerusalem when he came out one of the synoptic accounts will tell us, I'm revealing to you the Savior. That Mary came to the garden to check him. And she stayed there. You see why women are important in God's business? All the men came and they ran back out of here. But when the woman came, she stood there. She said, he said he will come back. I trust him. I don't know what I'm doing, but I trust him. And she saw this young man glowing in glory hovering around the garden and she looks at him and said Rabboni and she wanted to touch him he said no don't touch me the mission is not over yet because he came to give us more than forgiveness he came to give us victory are we together and then Paul now began to give us the discussion that happened in heaven when he got there as both the lamb and the high priest because the Levitical order, the principle that was given to them in the Old Testament was that when you were to offer sacrifices by the high priest, the lamb would have to be one year old. You know why? Because the age of the lamb determined the validity of the atonement. So when this ageless lamb drained out his blood and took it to the Holy of Holies, 
he offered that blood once and for all like you may have heard me say you want to know how long that atonement is find out the age of the lamb that died because he is ageless your atonement is ageless and when all that was done a coronation service according to Philippians 2 referencing on what David saw happened in heaven what was a coronation service that God so highly exalted him and in that coronation service I'm showing you the switch now from Savior to Lord Savior had finished his mission but a coronation service was held in heaven a name an office was given to him now the office that was given to him was always his own but it was his own alone the entire mission of relinquishing it and getting it back was so that you will share in it you get the point now you need when the bible says what manner of love you have to examine this so here's here's the thing um let's assume that pastor Dele is a doctor phd so let's assume that there was a system of also giving you phd without you having to work on it and so for that he will relinquish his own phd and go back and start as whatever it is now from foundation are we together and then you are said why did you have to do all of this you were already a doctor and he said i was a doctor alone but I found out that it may not be possible for you. It's not a good example, but it may not be possible for you based on the factors to become a doctor, to have a PhD. And so I want to leverage on my power and my credibility. And he went and before he would do the PhD, he entered into a covenant with you that everything I have from this point is also yours. So the moment he was given PhD, you suddenly checked your name and saw PhD everywhere and say, how did this happen? The Lordship that Jesus had, he always had it, but he had it alone. It was love that made him to give it up and start again so that this time around, we will be partakers. Is that in your Bible? Partakers, my goodness, my God. He is not the only one who is Lord. Uh-uh. You are a partaker of his lordship. If you do not know this, you will never command genuine, authentic power. No. The revelation of Savior saves you, but it does not empower you. Dominion is in the realm of knowing him as Lord. King of kings, Lord of lords, faithful and true, Lamb of God. We worship you, King of kings, Lord of lords, faithful and true, Lamb of God. Do you know why you need to know him as Savior and as Lord? Because when you go before the harvest, sometimes it is the Lordship that will give value to his being savior. As ye go, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers as proof that he can save. If you claim he can save your spirit, let me see what he can do with your body. Are we together? The Lord said to my Lord, sit down at the right hand. And Paul said, we are seated with him. So what are you called? Lord. Your Lordship is not absolute. Your Lordship is derived. And that is the reason why it also, it only functions under submission. The moment you are out of the governing influence of the Lord and the Christ, your Lordship will not work. The believer's dominion is not absolute dominion. It is derived. That is why it is only activated under submission. Hmm. 
Jesus as Savior, the revelation of his love and forgiveness, his mercy and his grace. Jesus as Lord, the revelation of his dominion, the extent of the reach of his power, that every time you are afraid to preach him as Savior, remember he is Lord. Meaning he can tame everything that threatens that mission. You need to know him as Lord, not just Savior. Let me tell you sincerely, when the missionaries came to, to Africa, most of them to preach, they knew Jesus as Savior, but many of them did not know his Lordship. And so most of them, even though they revealed him, they died of things they had the dominion to avoid. Because knowing him as Savior alone can be risky. You are walking in the world of men and there are spirits that fight the program of God. That was why when Jesus was test running the disciples, training them, he gave them the message. Matthew chapter 10. He said, go and preach. And then he says, as ye go, as ye go, don't just go to save alone. Demonstrate his lordship. Satan will try to stop you. He will try to take away resources. He will use men and systems to fight you. Remember, the earth is the Lord's. That means no divination and no enchantment against you using the elements of creation to stand. Because he is not only savior, he is Lord. When you understand that Jesus is Lord, you can know the sick will be healed in a crusade ground. The goal was not just to heal them. The goal was not just to deliver them. Are we together? The goal is to present Jesus. But in doing so, there are spirits. There are entities. There are forces that keep them down. And then Jesus as the Christ. The word Christ is the Greek word Christos. Christos means, number one, the anointed, but it also means the empowerment that comes with him. The Bible says, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13, very disturbing statement, I can do all things. Does that include bringing difficult harvests to the fold I can do not just because I understand the message not just because I know the earth is the Lord's I have the empowerment through Christ which strengtheneth me the revelation of Jesus as the Christ does something to you and gives you capacity it strengthens your witness and so you are able to do things you ordinarily would not be able to do the anointing tarry ye in Jerusalem until ye be empowered the empowerment did not come on the sinners the empowerment strengthens the laborer it makes the laborer to do unusual things you will find you don't call the tractor the harvester the farmer no there's usually someone, maybe sometimes of small stature, but his efficiency is because of the tools. This man has a great machine that can help to cover grounds. You see that now? So when you look like you are ordinary you, but you can take over Leicester for Jesus, the reason is because you have a revelation that you are also in partnership with the Christ. Listen, this is what gives us audacity. To do certain things there is a strengthening from inside that strength manifests as wisdom and power the bible says christ is made manifest as the wisdom of god and the power of god the strategy that makes for efficiency comes from the revelation of jesus not as savior not as lord but as christ the wisdom to exert dominion over the cosmos resides in the revelation of the Christ. It is that wisdom that can create a conference like this. You see that? 
for the purpose of empowering people and producing effective laborers there are many people who know jesus as savior they are aware of his lordship they are convinced but they cannot demonstrate the reality of the kingdom they do not know him as christ when you know jesus as christ there is a spirit that comes to honor that revelation he's called the spirit of god The Spirit of God gives credence to your revelation of Jesus as the Christ. Because Jesus speaking about the Holy Spirit, he said, I have many things to tell you, but ye cannot bear them now. How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. His first manifestation to you is wisdom, not even power. He will guide you to all truth. You see that? Then Acts chapter 1 verse 8, you'll be endued with power. Most believers think the anointing only ends in its power dimension. No. In fact, let me tell you the truth. The, the, the more frequent usage of the anointing in the life of the believer will be to supply the wisdom it takes to manifest the excellence of the saints. There is a kind of wisdom called the wisdom of the just. It's a realm of wisdom that is only found when you know him as Christ. That is where you will do things that when people look at you and look at the result, there is a difference. Listen, it is by that wisdom we will penetrate the cosmos. Remember, I told you that God's mission is threefold. The world of unbelievers, the world of believers. But when it has to do with territorial transformation, you need to know him as Christ. I know who thou art. Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. We are able to do the things we do today because we know him as Christ. By you I can run through a troop and by you I can leap over a wall. So Paul says it this way, I can do all things. Can you join Paul to make that statement? One more time. One more time. Now if you do not finish that statement, we will judge you with pride. How Do you know how many things are there to be done on earth? How dare you say I can do all things? Do all things means save the unsaved, reach the unreached. Do all things means obey God to the latter with result. I, can you do that? But it says through Christ. There is an energizing from within, inexplainable but undeniable. I can do all things. If he said, heal the sick, I can do all things. If he says, raise the dead, I can do all things. Are we together? If he says, preach in Samaria, Judea, it means UK cannot shut its gate over me. I can do all things. There is an ability within me that has the mandate of defending what God has told me. I can do all things. Academically, I can do all things. In business, I can do all things. This is the realm of territorial transformation. Listen, because the location of this harvest sometimes will demand you wearing a certain kind of regalia. You will not always look like a farmer, even though you are a farmer. But the wisdom in making this harvest sometimes will demand you wearing the garment of a wolf even though you are a sheep you wear the garment of a wolf not to deceive but to give you access to that space so he says to be wise as serpents and to be gentle as doves <laughs> you don't wear the garment of a wolf because you are a wolf the gate was only designed by cosmos to recognize wolves so you wear the garment so that you can go in that was the strategy that was used by the spies to enter into jericho they needed to adjust many things to get into jericho there are many of you who will carry a sickle and meet everybody and the gate says no we have been mandated to reject everyone who is holding a sickle so you put that sickle the regalia can be a PhD. The regalia can be a business form. The regalia can be a company. 
no terrorist comes as a terrorist even though they are terrorists they come as doctors they come as professors they are wearing the garment of wolves this is where the wisdom to take over cosmos comes from listen carefully hmm. <laughs> listen to me if all you are going to do in Leicester is hold a Bible wear your suit and harass everybody on the street you will be surprised that as well intentioned as you are you will join the reasons why the laborers are few the laborers are few because the ones who came became discouraged till they left they did not know that there is a skill that makes you a laborer there are some who were laborers before but they left because they did not know him as christ thou art christ the son of the living god when you say the harvest you see we've not spoken about the one some of you want to hear that as far as the earth remains i have sown i have sown where is the harvest hallelujah This harvest we're talking about now amen please look at me this church was planted in this city apostolically so because you are like a mast an antenna with multiple mandates number one to bring this harvest Number two, to help the discouraged laborers, to show them how to hold the sickle, to show them the skill required. Did you get that? The mandate does not just end in bringing many, but there are many tired laborers in Leicester. They once were laborers, but they waited from morning till night and there was no harvest. And they said, I'm tired. And just when they were about to leave, God sent you and said, hold on, you are still a laborer. I just need to teach you. Because he that strives for mastery is not crowned until he strives lawfully. There is a way we hold the sword in the spirit to win. If you don't know how to hold the sword, you will not be able to do much. Just because you have the sling and the stone does not mean Goliath will fall. There is a skill you need to be trained and I will give you pastors according to my heart Jeremiah 3 15 and they will feed you this is what is happening to you my dear people there is a training there is a sharpening iron is sharpening iron now you are learning so for some of you who are about to stop being laborers because you were told that all laborers must be preachers now you are learning that when you know Jesus as the Christ, you will know that your pulpit is not an object standing like this. You wear that regalia with honor, with the mentality of a laborer. Being a pastor is only a process that leads you eventually to being a laborer, effective laborer, and training others. Are we together? If everyone under the sound of my voice becomes a laborer, skilled, sharpened, quickened, once upon a time the apostles were zealous in being laborers, but they did not wait to be trained. Jesus went up the Mount of Transfiguration and they came down, they said, look, we can't wait. They brought an epileptic patient and they labored there. Therein was a revelation of how difficult the harvest will be when you are not trained. He teaches my hands, my fingers to fight. One more time. He teaches my hands, my fingers for the last time. He teaches my hands to war, my fingers. Oh, 
there is a way that God can train you in one week you will bring such great harvest listen if you're a minister of the gospel here listen there is a skill to this thing you can hold the sword in such a way that you do much for the kingdom you will speak in a certain way you will access his wisdom and communicate it you will reveal it to the world of men in a way that would dumbfound principalities and powers my last scripture Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10 now to the intent that unto principalities and powers might be made known by the church the ecclesia the manifold multifaceted wisdom of God wisdom of God it is not all about falling down and standing up it is not all about shouting it is that his anointing comes upon you does something to your understanding and you begin to produce results that are beyond the realm of mere men are you ready to pray the harvest is truly wide but the laborers are few let me add, the laborers are unskilled. The laborers are untrained. The laborers are frustrated. It is the reason why they are few. Some laborers are uninterested, but some laborers are interested. They do not just know the art of war. Their hands have not been trained to fight. Their fingers have not been trained to work valiantly in battle. We are going to pray. Prayer point number one. I desire to be a laborer. I desire to be a laborer. Someone pray. The envoy, are you praying? I desire to be a laborer. I desire to be a laborer. I love you enough to desire to be part of your program. I love you enough to desire to see the unsaved saved. I love you enough that with my life and under my watch within the territory you have assigned unto me everyone who is not saved will be saved through the efficiency of my witness. I desire to be a laborer beyond being a church member I have been a church member for years but I desire to be a laborer I've been a pastor a church administrator I've been a banker I've been an entrepreneur a businessman I've been a parent a spouse but I desire that switch be a laborer. Hallelujah. Final prayer point for this morning. And before we make that prayer point, let me lend my voice with Pastor to encourage you. See today all through to tomorrow as a retreat. For some of you, see it as a solemn assembly. The Spirit of God calling you to expound to you the way of the kingdom more perfectly that something will rest upon your life that you would not just see this as a theme of a conference but that he is doing a work in you this is only the first session that means you owe it to call everybody you can find in Leicester and tell them light is coming a season is about to end and another is about to begin in my life and you invite them to be partakers and for some of you what you have learned now you may not have the power yet through light to use the sickle but you can draw the harvest closer so that they are saved that is also a role every role you play around that field is not worthy our final prayer point will be the scripture i just quoted to teach my hands to war, my fingers to fight. What is the strategy? There is something you can do with me, oh God, that makes me a profound, phenomenal witness 
a co-laborer. Teach my hands to war. Go ahead and pray. You are the Lord of the harvest. It's with your hands that the harvest happens agriculturally. Teach my hands to war. Teach my fingers to fight. I am tired of inefficiency. Bring me to a realm of mastery. Bring me to a realm of grace.